Um, it's a real, real pleasure to be here. Very grateful to Patrick for the invitation. Thank you to Jana and to Pete and everyone else who's involved in organizing it. For both Jana and myself, it's a real, a special pleasure to be speaking to you at the, well, not physically at, but virtually at the Havens Wright Center. Both John and I are in one way or another kind of the academic grandchildren of Eric Olin Wright. We both work very much in his tradition and have taken a lot of inspiration from his work. So it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, can everyone also see these slides? Could you just give me a thumbs up if you could see my mouse in the slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So as uh, you might have gathered from the kind of advertising for this talk, the two of us, John and myself, are working on a book on the puzzle of the high rate of incarceration in the US today. Everyone has heard of this puzzle. I think everyone knows that the rate today in the United States is very high, but it's useful to begin by stating the obvious about what that means. What it means really for the rate to be high is that the rate is high relative to rates in other places and in other times. So you, you can't really convey the force of the puzzle of mass incarceration by simply observing that today, roughly 1% of American adults are incarcerated in jails and prisons. That observation maybe has some normative force, but as a social scientific matter, the force of the puzzle requires you to say something about how the rate today compares to rates elsewhere. Often, this elsewhere is simply America in the past. So scholars will often observe that the incarceration rate in the US increased dramatically between the past and the present from a rate of roughly 100, 150 per 100,000 to a rate of roughly 700, 750 prisoners per 100,000 people. So that graph is before you. This is a graph of the number of prisoners in prisons and jails per 100,000 people over the course of American history. Now you see this graph and you see a puzzle. What changed? What happened in the United States starting in the 1970s? But even historical context is insufficient, we think, to convey the real force of the American puzzle because that force is both historical and comparative. The significance of the puzzle of mass incarceration is clarified by observing that the United States today incarcerates people at a rate that is among the highest in world history. Other comparable developed countries incarcerate something like an order of magnitude smaller share of their population than the United States. So you can see now on your graph in gray, these are other developed countries and their rates of incarceration over time. So the research puzzle is a comparative and historical puzzle. Why does America today incarcerate such an exceptionally large share of its population? We're noting the obvious importance of the historical and comparative context in framing the puzzle to make the following point. What we think is ironic about existing work on mass incarceration is that while the whole literature is animated by what is really a comparative and historical puzzle, there is in fact not that much work which seeks to study the problem in a comparative and historical way. Rather, the dominant approach is to try to understand mass incarceration by studying it directly, by studying America during its recent history. To use the language that Orlando Patterson has used to describe the modern social sciences, most work on mass incarceration is presentist, focused on the present, and it's also America-centric in that it's very focused on America. Our provocation in this presentation will be that this presentism and this America-centrism has produced two kinds of problems in the literature on mass incarceration in our understanding of mass incarceration. First, the lack of comparative and historical work has left us with what's actually quite a thin and patchy understanding of the thing we're trying to explain. And we're gonna call this a descriptive problem. And this is really what I'm going to speak mostly about today. Second, we think that the failure to study mass incarceration comparatively risks leaving us with incomplete explanations of the outcome that we're trying to explain. And this is, as John will explain more, this is because studying it, studying the phenomenon in an America-centric presentist way leads scholars to unwittingly condition that's control for key parts of the complex of causes that generate mass incarceration. We're gonna argue this point in a little bit more detail. John will talk about it 
in a little bit. So what we're going to do today basically is discuss each of these problems in turn. Our talk, therefore, is going to be mainly negative and kind of exhortative. We're going to be arguing that scholars have made a mistake studying mass incarceration in the way that they have. Because we see these things, we, we see things in this way, we have kind of been heeding our own exhortations and working on a positive contribution. For the last few years, we've been aiming to study mass incarceration in comparative and historical perspective. We've, for about two years, maybe now two and a half years, been leading a team of almost three dozen research assistants in an effort to collect comparative and historical data on prisons, police, violence, and other related criminal justice statistics. Um, we've been trying to collect these data for most countries and almost all of the modern period. It's been loosely inspired by the success of things like Thomas Piketty's efforts to collect long-run comparative data on inequality. The figure before you right now, which is kind of inscrutable, shows where we have data on three of our most important series, prisoners, police, and homicides. So green is where we have data. You can see countries are on the y-axis, time is on the x-axis. So we have collected a lot of data from most of the 20th century, a lot of the 19th century, and we're trying basically to fill in this graph if it's possible. Um, but we've also been collecting a lot of more specific data than simply prisoners, police, and homicides. So this is an example of all the data that we have for one of our key cases, which is Australia. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but we've just been, this is just to say that we've been trying to collect other data as well. What are we trying to do with these data set? The, the, the data set? Well, we're working on a few uh, papers and we're hoping to release the data set for public use. But John and I are also working on a book which has the title of this presentation called From Plantation to Prison, which is based partly on these data and partly on some country based comparisons, which John will describe in a little bit. And the primary objective of that book is to propose an explanation for the puzzle of mass incarceration. Now, even though the presentation that we're giving shares a name with that book, you're not unfortunately going to get the full argument. And that's more or less because our argument is still patchy, still developing. We are gonna say something about what we think. John will say something about what we think, but you're not going to really hear good reasons today to believe that we are correct. We are very hopeful that that will change by the time that our publisher demands the book from us. But at this stage, we're not super confident in our own explanation. In fact, that's one of the reasons we're very excited to present, which is we want to hear what you think as well. And we want to be, we want to learn from you as well as hopefully try to teach you some things. So what I'm gonna focus on myself is the descriptive issues, which I think have been induced by the failure to study mass incarceration and comparative and historical perspective. There, there are quite a few of them um, in this presentation as it's been set up. And I'm gonna just focus on one for want of time. I can talk about the others if you're curious in the Q&A. So there's a first and a second, but I'm gonna focus on this one. And by this one, what I mean is that the descriptive problem I wanna talk about today is raised by the fact that conceptually, the incarceration rate is a really dense social fact. It's the result of a long chain of social processes which culminate in incarceration. The stock of people in prison is the result of police choosing to apprehend someone for an alleged crime, courts convicting them, choosing to send them to prison, and prisons proposing to hold them there for some length of time, often prescribed by legislatures or whoever else. So what this means is that the incarceration rate itself, the stock of people in prison in any given year, can vary for a variety of reasons. It can vary if the level of crime varies, it can vary if police behavior varies, if court and legal protections vary, if sentence lengths vary, even if prison capacity varies. So there are lots of different determinants of the incarceration rate. Now, why does this matter? You might not ask, how, how does this change how we might think about the puzzle? Well, first consider that when you're introduced to the puzzle of America's high incarceration rate, it's very natural to think that the puzzle lies inside the criminal justice system. This is the kind of approach that John and I both took when we first started writing about this six, seven years ago. It's natural to think that America has mass incarceration because its criminal justice system responds with exceptional punitiveness to ordinary levels of wrongdoing. 
But an exceptionally high incarceration rate could in fact just be the result of an ordinary criminal justice response to exceptional levels of violence. Consider that even if two countries have the same level of crime and the same level of incarceration, they may also turn that given level of crime into that given level of incarceration in different ways. One country might apprehend a lot of people, but sentence them to short periods of time. The other might apprehend only a fraction of people, but sentence them to long periods of time. So any good explanation has to have something to say about this as well. Now, for obvious reasons, it's very difficult to say anything about either of these issues without comparative and historical perspective. To understand how America produces its exceptional, exceptionally high incarceration rate, you need comparative and historical data on the different inputs that together constitute the incarceration rate. So this is something that we have set out to do in our data collection. So let me start with this, what you see on your screen, which is a preliminary decomposition of the incarceration rate. The incarceration rate on the left, prisoners over population, can be decomposed into the rate of crime and the rate of incarceration per crime. The first quantity is obviously the crime rate. The second quantity we call punitiveness, but you can just think of it as the rate at which a society turns crime into prisoners. A society can have an exceptionally high incarceration rate, as I said earlier, either because it has an exceptionally high crime rate or because it is exceptionally punitive or some combination of the two. So how does the US compare when you decompose in this way? Now, to make this comparison, you have to define and estimate the amount of crime in a given society at a given time. This is very, very challenging. It's one of probably, probably the principal challenge that we face in our comparative and historical approach. We propose to do this in our work by using the incidence of homicide. We do that for two different reasons. First, we do it for reasons of measurement. Homicide is just much more reliably measured than any other kind of crime. Very otherwise, other kinds of crimes like assault are defined differently by different countries. Records of how often they occur are more likely to be absent. And when they're not absent, they're subject to all kinds of reporting biases. These issues do also apply to the homicide rate, but they're just much less acute in the case of the homicide rate. We have made some attempts, economic historians in particular have made attempts to estimate, for instance, the homicide rate in say like 16th century England, but we have no idea how to estimate the incidence of salt in that same period. The second reason to think about it in this way to estimate it by homicides, which is a separate reason, is conceptual. We think that what we're interested in as social scientists when decomposing the incarceration rate in this way is to understand how different countries react to something like, to the incidence of something like serious interpersonal harm, serious interpersonal crime. That's kind of what it means. That's kind of what punitiveness means. Punitive, punitiveness means how does a society turn serious interpersonal harm into criminal justice outcomes? But this level of serious interpersonal harm really can't be measured by the total number of crimes that a state criminalizes, by the crime rate that I was showing you earlier. Because if that were right, you would want to collect data on the number of times people chew gum in Singapore. That's illegal in Singapore. That's where my wife is from. Or the number of times a person says they don't believe in God in Pakistan, which is where I'm from, the crime of blasphemy. We don't do this when estimating the non-homicide crime rate, which means that we're already kind of implicitly weighing crimes by something like their objective harmfulness rather than their declared state decreed harmfulness. So if this is right, then there's no reason that all crimes with non-zero weights, that all crimes that typically figure in the crime rate should have equivalent weights. After all, non-zero weighted crimes like assault and things like this, they're not assault and theft and larceny. These aren't equivalently harmful at all. Imagine in your head, for instance, two fictitious groups of 10 people. In one, there are 10 petty thefts. In another, there are 10 petty thefts and one murder. The crime rates in these two groups would be very similar, but the rate of serious harm is very, very different. So even if you think that the homicide rate is a biased estimate of the crime rate, as some would say it is, it is almost certainly our best estimate of this kind of welfare-weighted conceptual measure of harm that I'm proposing. Now, I, I'm, I should say I'm spending a little bit of time on this. John disagrees with me a little bit about this, so if you'd like, you can ask us more about this. We're still thinking exactly about how to justify this and how to think about this. But my point to you is that this is another reason to think that we should use homicide to estimate the kind of quantity that I've put in the equation here. 
I'm happy to talk more about this again in the Q&A, but I, I, let me move on. So this is the decomposition. This is the first kind of decomposition we want to propose to you. Now, now that I've shown you the equation, let me show you what it looks like when we try and calculate this across place, across, sorry, across rich countries today in the present. As the graph in front of you shows, so it has the incarceration rate on the left, as you can see, the US is an outlier. You immediately see when you look at a graph like this that the United States is distinguished mainly not by its level of punitiveness, which is on the right, the rightmost panel, but by its homicide rate, which is in the middle. The United States is about six to seven times more violent than the median developed country. It is only slightly above the median developed country in terms of punitiveness. And there are some countries, Spain, Austria, New Zealand, which are more punitive than it is. Already, we hope you can see why a comparative perspective is illuminating. We think, again, as I was saying earlier, the natural temptation, if the puzzle of American mass incarceration is stated simply as the puzzle of America's high incarceration rate, is to conceive of this as a puzzle of punitiveness. This is why I think so many explanations of why America has mass incarceration focus on its especially, allegedly especially punitive politicians or its allegedly especially punitive public. But if you're right, if we are right to think of the decomposition in this way, to use the homicide rate to estimate the level of serious crime, it suggests that this focus might have been a mistake. It suggests that the inc incarceration rate is the result, not just, maybe not even mainly of what is happening inside America's criminal justice system, but a result of America's broader political economy, the broader social structure that has yielded this very high homicide rate. <coughs> Provocatively, I think it suggests that the puzzle of American mass incarceration lies in substantial part outside rather than inside the criminal justice system. Now note that punitiveness, which is on the right, is itself a dense fact. So prisoners over homicides, which I've been calling punitiveness, that itself can be informatively decomposed. Punitiveness equals what we're calling the footprint times the penal balance. So prisoners over homicides equals, just as an identity, police over homicides times prisoners over police. The first is sort of the number of police available given the level of violence. You can think of it again as the state footprint. And the second is the extent to which a given society relies on prisons rather than the police. So what does this decomposition teach us about the United States? Well, you can see once you decompose the once you decompose the punitiveness ratio in this way, you see that the United States is a land of low state footprint, almost exceptionally so in the developed world, and an extreme reliance on prisons rather than the police. So to put it in another way, the fact that overall punitiveness in the United States is not that distinctive hides two distinctive features of America's penal state. One way of saying this is that the United States relies much less heavily on what criminologists have called penal certainty, which is something like the probability that you'll be apprehended conditional on committing serious harm. This is a, approximated by the state footprint and much more heavily on penal severity, the expected length of sentence that someone will receive if apprehended, if they encounter the police. This fact, the distinctive distribution of penal capacity across prisoners and policing, severity and certainty, is also something for which any good explanation of mass incarceration has to account. And then as you'll see when John starts speaking, this is important to our explanation, or at least to what we're thinking about right now. But it's something that we think in general, the literature hasn't really taken too much note of because it hasn't really thought about this puzzle in comparative terms. That's not to say that no one has noticed this or no one has written about it. Bill Stuntz, William Stuntz wrote a fantastic book about American punishment, which was centrally about this fact. But even he wasn't thinking quite in comparative terms in the way that we were thinking. Maybe I'll just pause briefly to reflect on this fact, which actually surprised both of us when we first noticed it. It's fair, I think, today to say that discussions of the American penal state tend to collapse the problem of American policing into the problem of American mass incarceration. People tend to assume that the American penal state is generally overdeveloped. Just as America has an enormous number of prisoners, so it must also have a large army of police officers. 
Yet, as these data suggest, policing and incarceration don't really in the United States relate in this way. If the carceral arm of the American penal state is massively overdeveloped by comparative and historical standards, its police arm is in some sense underdeveloped relative to these other countries. The footprint of policing in the United States is closer to actually what you see in today's developing world and yesterday's developed world rather than other countries in the developed world. Now, let me just run through one other set of decompositions and then I'll turn it over to John. These decompositions are informative because we've compared the United States to comparable countries, but just note that you can also learn something by setting the United States in comparison to a different set of countries. Ex-slave societies in the Americas and the Caribbean, which obviously the United States shares a very important fact uh, of its history with, and also some other poor and middle income countries. And John will say a little bit more about why we include these in the comparison. So what, what does it look like when you do this, when you compare it to, as you see, a different set of countries on the y-axis on the left? Well, you see now that the incarceration rate, the comparison flips the earlier story a little bit on its head. Now, when you decompose it with respect to rich countries, you, you saw that the United States had ordinary levels of punitiveness and high levels of violence. Once you compare it to poor countries, actually it suggests something more like standard intuitions. America has high incarceration rates, low levels of violence and outlying levels of punitiveness. Now, the way to think about this is not that one or the other story is correct, but that both are simultaneously true. Let me just present one more set of decompositions and then I'll knit this together. If you decompose the second equation that I had shown you, if you decompose it in that way, you see that America's very high levels of punitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the median country in the Americas and other poor countries, not explained by the footprint of its state, which is right around the median for the developing world. Rather, it's explained by the state's heavy reliance on prisoners, on something like penal severity. In other words, the United States turns its developing country state footprint into a stock of prisoners with greater efficiency than any country in the region. Amongst countries in the world, actually only Iran and Rwanda seem to have higher prisoner to police ratios. Okay, this is, I think, probably been a lot of information, but you can, you can actually summarize it pretty simply. So this graph tries to do that. It tries to summarize that. Versus the rich world, which is the two parallels that you see on the top, America's high incarceration rate, which is shown on the left, top left panel, is the product of high violence and ordinary punitiveness, but punitiveness divided in a particular way, which is what you see on the top right. A penal balance exceptionally skewed towards prisoners. Versus the poor world, America's high incarceration rate looks like the product of an especially high level of punitiveness. And this high level of punitiveness seems to mostly be a function of the nature of its penal balance, an ordinary state footprint, but an exceedingly efficient penal state at turning footprint into prisoners. So we think that one way of summarizing all of this is with the following kind of catchphrase, whatever you want to call it. America is violent for a rich country, strikingly so, strikingly violent compared to other European countries, yet strikingly rich for a violent country. It's strikingly rich in the sense that it has a striking kind of state capacity that other poor countries, which are also very violent, other countries in the Americas don't have. The first part of this phrase identifies American punishment with its outlying levels of punishment, again, relative to other rich countries. It doesn't differ from other rich countries in the alacrity with which its criminal justice system turns social disorder or interpersonal harm into prisoners. It just differs in how much more violent it is. But the second part identifies American punishment with the peculiar capacities of the American state. America doesn't differ from other violent countries in how violent it is. In fact, it's a little less violent than countries in the Americas or significantly less violent than countries in the Americas, but in its capacity to turn violence into prisoners. That's what really distinguishes it. And it does this interestingly, not through its infrastructural power, not through the footprint of its state, the extent to which it supervenes on social life, you might say, but through the efficiency of its penal apparatus at turning a given level of infrastructural power into a stock of prisoners. Okay, my work here is done and I'm gonna hand it over to John, who's gonna share his slides. Thank you.
I don't know. Can everyone see my slides here? Is this working? Yes, great. Okay. So, um, let's. So, so Adana focused on the descriptive uh, uh, puzzle of mass incarceration that we have, in some ways, uh, broken down uh, into these decompositions. And in this uh, section of the talk, I'm going to talk about the historical dimension of that. And I'm both going to do that to give you a better sense of the history of, of these decompositions themselves. And because I want to try to give you a kind of rudimentary sketch of the kind of explanation that we want to give for American exceptionalism in punishment, you know, how it evolved and, and, and why, it, why it evolved. So this graph um, shows the incarceration rate in developed countries here in the leftmost panel, um, decomposed into the rate of violence in the middle panel and the level of punitiveness in the right, rightmost panel. So here, uh, Canada and Australia the, are the blue developed countries that we're comparing to in our case study and, and the, all the other developed countries are in black. So I'd like to call you your attention to one thing uh, that you can see in these graphs. It is common to say, indeed, I think both Adana and I have often presented it in these terms in the past, that in the 1950s or in the 60s, the US incarcerated people at a rate that was comparable uh, to rates seen in the rest of the developed world. Uh, and in the 1970s, something started to change, right? And this change, someone will say, is the puzzle of mass incarceration. Yet, I think if you decompose the incarceration rate in the way we've done, you can see that this, was, this way of framing the puzzle is actually a bit misleading. Yes, the incarceration rate in the US in the early to mid 20th century was comparable to other countries in the developed world. Yet the US was also a much more violent place than those countries. And what this means is that America's average incarceration rate it masked the fact that America had a actually comparatively low level of punitiveness by our definition. I think it's therefore misleading to say that the US was once like other developed countries, but now is not like them. That I think misstates the fact of American exceptionalism, which are more the facts of American exceptionalism, which are more enduring. America in a sense has always been different, or maybe not always, right? We'll, we'll get to that in a sec. America's relatively low historical levels of punitiveness uh, might, I think, be surprising to us today, for it's common to assume America has mass incarceration because of an enduring feature of American culture, which led it to be more punitive. Yeah, I think this assumption is not supported by the historical evidence. As you can see in the leftmost panel here, prior to the 1870s, the US had a relatively low incarceration rate. And though it's invisible, it's not visible in this graph, that low rate was actually consistent throughout the 19th century. Uh, the US um, ha had a consistently lower rate than other uh, comparable countries. And this is, I think, partly explained by the slave regime in the South, which had little use for prisons. But importantly, the American North was at that time world renowned for being comparatively lenient towards criminals, specifically for orientating its prisons system towards reform rather than retribution. You might know that it was in fact to study its progressive prisons that Alexis de Tocqueville visited the US in the 1830s. It was the relative leniency in his view of American punishment which made it a model for the world. So here, I think you might wonder, why was the American North so lenient? Why did you see a relatively lower incarceration rate in the American North and why were its prisons uh, seen as um, comparatively um, uh, less uh, punishing or brutal than, than, than European prisons? So the sociologist Francois Bonnet has suggested that prison conditions are governed by what he calls the principle of less eligibility, because prisons have to deter, they have to be undesirable to those living outside prisons. Consider what this implies. The better conditions are outside, the better conditions can be inside. This is a reasonable explanation, according to Bonnet, for why conditions today in American prisons are so awful and why prison reform meets with limits. Life at the bottom of American class structure today is awful, and prison has to be worse than this. It's also, I think, a reasonable explanation for why US prisons in the 19th century weren't so awful. As Tocqueville himself noted, the availability of cheap land on the frontier, made available by violent conquest, provided a kind of de facto social safety net for white Americans. And thus prisons could deter crime without reducing prisoners to the abject conditions common in Europe. And the examples would be uh, levels of corporal punishment in prison, uh, the, the extent of, of prison mortality, 
Uh, certainly, the uh, northern prisons uh, appear to have, have, have been compared to European prisons of the time, uh, uh, less brutal. Uh, of course, in other ways, uh, silence uh, at the, the silent regime and, and solitary confinement drove people insane. So there's no, there's, these are there are many different ways that we can measure these things. But certainly, if we measure just the incarceration rate, it does appear to have been relatively low. So that same cheap land may also explain why American crime rates in this era were, as far as we can tell, no higher than European crime rates. Although our evidence here is still fragmentary and isn't actually visible on the graph. Uh, uh, so let's go back to that graph. You can see that um, we don't have good evidence for um, uh, uh, homicide in the 19th century, but it doesn't appear to have been higher than, than, than comparable European countries. And that's despite the relatively slim presence of law enforcement, especially in frontier areas. And I'll return to the question of police presence uh, below. But America lost its reputation for leniency after the Civil War, both because of the draconian punishments inflicted on freed African-Americans in the South, but also because the conditions of the poorest Americans deteriorated and its prisons adopted more, a, a more retributive ethos. And for related reasons, America also began to become a comparatively violent place in this era. So given the principle of less eligibility, you might expect America to have seen a dramatic rise in incarceration after the Civil War. After all, in this period, inequality and crime did soar, we know. Cheap frontier lands did become less accessible and no alternative social safety net was put in place. But as you can see from our graph, um, by our measure of punitiveness, America is, as a whole actually remained comparatively less punitive well into the 20th century. What explains this? I don't think that yet we have a, the full answer, but I have a kind of hypothesis that I'd like to share. So I think it's because for most of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, white Americans, non-Black Americans in Northern cities could still migrate West and to rural areas to avoid immiseration in hard times. The depression of the 1930s was the first nationwide economic downturn the US faced without a free frontier to absorb the shock of job loss. And when crime did inevitably spike in the Great Depression, the US incarceration rate, as you can see, did indeed rise and it rose far above that of other rich countries, many of whom arguably fared worse in the depression. So the New Deal jobs programs stemmed the rise in crime and incarceration, but both, both of those things rose again uh, when those programs were cut back in the 1930s. What ultimately reversed the tremendous rise of incarceration in the 30s was the buildup to World War II, which created a massive number of jobs and led to a very dramatic reduction in crime rates that you can see here. But and I think this is a pivotal difference for us. In the 1970s, there was no equivalent large scale spending relief. Indeed, the economic recession in that decade was exacerbated by the reduction in military spending following the end of the, the Vietnam War. So I would venture that something like mass incarceration in some sense would have come to the US earlier in the absence of World War II as it did in the 70s. Why? Because I think the US, unlike Western Europe, had no social safety net to replace the frontier when urban to rural migration was finally reversed, beginning in the 1930s, but then continuously on from then on. And that reversal, uh, that, 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 that reversal of the, 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 uh, the, the rural frontier from being a social safety net to being a, a source of pressure in urban labor markets, um, uh, that led to uh, 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 overwhelming the fragmentary and underfunded infrastructure of urban poverty relief in America. And we see that both in the 1930s and in the 1970s. And because much of the rural to urban migration took the form of black share, sharecroppers fleeing labor oppressive agriculture in the South, the reversal also intensified existing racial tensions within America's working class. So this is the story that we focus on in our Catalyst essay. Right? We, we argue there that the coincidence of the baby boom, the second great migration and northern deindustrialization led to an unprecedented rise of crime in the, in the US beginning in the late 60s. But these things should be seen, I think, as proximate triggers for mass incarceration. For the deeper cause, we would look to the, the enduring weakness of American labor, its incapacity to leverage redistribution from rich people in rich places to poor people in poor places. This itself is largely explained, we argue, by the profound effect of slavery on American political and economic institutions, which enabled American elites to exploit racial divisions among American workers, thereby undermining the formation of a labor movement, a labor party, social democracy. The weakness of American labor meant that US elites were able to resist pressure to redistribute income. 
of course, politicians of all stripes in the 70s as well as in the 30s had to be seen to do something about crime. The crime was real, it was rising. But we argue that absent pressures from below, elites will always opt for penal rather than social solutions. And this is not because they are necessarily malevolent, although many elites, of course, are, but rather because penal solutions are always cheaper than social spending, right? For even if the cost of incarceration, incarcerating someone is about the same as the cost of providing them with education, healthcare, or childcare, which is actually, it's not, but even if it were, in a robust welfare state, the number of people who receive those latter benefits will always vastly exceed the number of people incarcerated, right? So it's roughly, as Adana mentioned, 1% of adults receive, you know, in, in prison today, in prison and jails today, you know, much larger share of adults receiving the very weak social supports that the American state currently offers them. So the total tax burden, therefore, on the wealthy will always accordingly be much higher for social rather than penal spending. Mass incarceration is, in this sense, we argue, best viewed as a symptom of austerity. Okay, so that's the argument that we put forward in the Catalyst piece. Can we simply leave it there? I think we'd thought so, right? But, but when we looked at these de decompositions, we, um, we admittedly had, had not said much, perhaps, about the enduring facts of American violence, uh, but our assumption there was that this itself was largely explained by America's racialized patterns of inequality and concentrated poverty. After all, structural impediments to redistribution from rich people in rich places to poor people in poor places has meant that American violence is highly concentrated in places of the fewest means of addressing it in any way, but especially by providing jobs, a social safety net, the kind of things that, that are effective in, in, in reducing crime. So our de decompositions, though, have shown us another dimension of American incarceration. So in its, in its direct response to crime, as Adana showed, America today has a marked tendency to lean more on prisons than policing. So in our terminology, it has chosen penal severity over penal certainty. And it turns out this too has a long history. And I think it can, can help, ex and understanding that history can help explain the pattern of high violence and high punitiveness in the post 70s era. So just as we did in the cross-sectional graphs, we can decompose America's punitiveness and examine that decom decomposition historically. So here you can see that America's contemporary low police footprint in the middle here and high penal balance on the right has in fact been a persistent feature of American exceptionalism. America has always had a much higher ratio of prisoners to police than other developed countries as well as a much lower number of police per homicide. Moreover, the penal balance here has increased dramatically in recent years, you can see on the right. What explains these historical patterns? As we can see here, the US's high penal balance is not the result of having fewer police per capita today. In population terms, America was relatively underpoliced prior to the 1930s, after which it converged to the developed world. Sorry. But as we have seen, the normality of American police per capita after the 1930s masks the fact that compared to other developed countries, American police are tasked with addressing a much greater level of violence in the police footprint here and incarcerating a much larger number of people in the penal balance here. So one might say that, so one way we might account for this is by pointing out that largely due to the influence of slave owners, the American constitution effectively barred federal government involvement from law enforcement in the US delegating all police powers to the states. And the Fugitive Slave Court Clause was of course a telling exception to that. At the same time, local Republican electorates in the North also jealously guarded their ability to enforce their own laws to such an extent that vigilante justice was a widely accepted feature of American democracy in the 19th century. As a result of these twin influences, the constitutional and democratic, law enforcement in the US has long remained a highly localized patchwork affair, subject to a greater degree than in other countries to local electorates. When 19th century robber barons, for instance, wanted to suppress labor movements, they had to hire Pink Pinkerton militias, private militias, or enlist federal troops, because the police could rarely be trusted to side with outsiders against locals. So this meant that the responsibility for apprehending lawbreakers, as well as most decisions about sentencing the convicted, was delegated in the US to the part of the American government with the fewest revenues and the weakest state capacity. 
For a long time, this feature of the division of powers also limited the reach of law enforcement, for it meant that accused could generally flee prosecution by fleeing the state. And Turfield and, and Beaumont talk a lot about this in their, in their account of, of, of America in the, 19, in the 1830s. So our hypothesis is that faced with these limited revenues and the inability to apprehend or the limited ability to apprehend absconding offenders, local officials who jealously guarded that power to enforce the law tried to make an example of those they did apprehend by handing out more severe sentences. So a penal balance skewed to severity in this way is typical of weak states, for the cost of an extra prisoner is typically less than the cost of an extra policeman. As such, the American skew might simply be a function of its exceptionally localized police force. But there's an additional dimension here. So the structure of state funding of police versus prisons in the US also shifts the fiscal cost of increased severity up the chain of government from the local to the state and today even the federal level. So while police are generally funded by local taxpayers, a much broader and deeper pool of taxpayers funds America's prisons. As a result, from the perspective of those making most of the decisions about sentencing, as well as many of the decisions about uh, law and, and policing, the immediate cost of increasing the severity of punishment by incarcerating more people for longer amounts of time is always, I think, much lower than the cost of increasing the certainty of punishment by hiring, hiring more and better trained police. In Frank Zimmering's terms, US cities and counties receive a, quote, carceral free lunch that exacerbates an existing skew to severity. Of course, we saw that the US eventually did see a secular rise in the number of police per capita after the 1930s, and that matched the development world average. And as in other countries, the deployment of that larger and more professionalized police meant that over time, the US could afford to be less severe in its punishments, right? We do see a, a, a decline up, up until the 1970s, a consistent decline in punishment severity. But even as it declined, the penal balance in the US always remained more skewed towards prison than in other countries for the reason that we've outlined. So why is this relevant to our account of mass incarceration? Because I would argue in the 70s, a sharp rise in crime coincided with an economic downturn and a fiscal crisis of the states and the states here, right? The individual states and especially the cities. And as I emphasized above, this time there was no massive military buildup to step in and replace the lost jobs. As a result, the penal skew already existing in American punishment rapidly increased to levels that the US had not seen since the 1880s. But given the tight-fistedness of American elites, it's not a surprise that local police prosecutors, judges, and politicians facing rising pressure to do something, anything about crime, opted to get tough rather than address the root causes of crime with redistributive social policy. Nor, I think, at this point, should it be a surprise that they chose to emphasize prisons rather than police in their get tough strategies. Had they done otherwise, for example, had the US operated with a federal police force like most other countries, a national police force that could then be rapidly increased or expanded uh, using federal taxpayers' money, it's not clear that the outcome would have been any less horrific in my view. The US today would probably be less of a carceral state and more of a police state, but the misery and injustice of America's prison systems would likely remain high along with its grotesque racial biases. That, that trade-off between prison and police, I think is not a trade-off I'd wish on my worst enemy, although Adana and Chris may have more to say about this tomorrow. But it nonetheless remains the case that given America's weak social safety net, the penal skew of American law enforcement is largely responsible for mass incarceration as we know it. So we've talked for a long time and I could talk for more about the book project and what we had help, hope to do with these comparisons and why it's structured in that way. But rather than do that, maybe I think it, it'd be good to now hand over the questions because we've, we've given the description of the decomposition, we've given a very sketchy outline of explanation and it'd be really helpful for us, I think, to hear your, your feedback. But again, happy to talk more about the structure of the book if people would like. Wow, so that was really excellent and super fascinating. I mean, I'm sure that's provoked a lot of questions. I wrote down four of my own, um, but I'll hold off on those or I'd probably only ask one if I get the chance, but I wanna to defer to the rest of you. So as Adana and John said at the outset, they're really looking for people's feedback and their questions. So I wanna encourage people to do that. So they're, and they're, you're probably familiar with this, but I'll nonetheless go over it. There are two ways to do this. One is that you can go on camera and ask your question yourself. The other 
is that you can, and then the way you do that is go to the reactions button at the far right of the menu at the bottom and just simply raise your hand and that'll alert me that you wanna ask a question. The other way is to write it into the chat if you're a little shyer about going on camera and I'll read it out for you. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take three at a time and then you know Adana and John can fight with each other over who wants to go first in responding to them. So um, I've got questions already. So I anticipated this might be the case. So Simon Balto, um, would like to ask a question. Simon, go ahead and activate. There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the event. Um, there's a lot here that I that I appreciate and uh, and agree with. I also am a little bit. I wonder if there's sort of a fatal flaw in this data. Um, and so, what I mean by that is, um, you're hinging all of your analysis on homicides. And um, I understand and agree with the logic for doing that. I mean, as, as Adonner pointed out, basically every other form of activity that's criminalized is done so in a way that's wildly inequitable, that's wildly difficult to measure, um, and so on and so forth. And so if we know that homicides are the only criminalized activity that's reliably reported, that it makes sense to, to sort of pay attention there. However, dealing with homicides is like less than 1% of what police and prisons actually do. And um, so in particular, I am not convinced by the argument that America is an under-policed society, especially based upon this data set um, that is reliant upon um, police activity that doesn't actually measure police activity at all. Um, you know, that police in the United States, the average a uh, police officer in the United States is never gonna deal with a homicide case. Um, and so, you know, how do you sort of reconcile the fact that you're making this really strong argument um, about like an entire history of this social phenomenon that a lot of historians um, among other people have, have been studying. Um, how do you sort of reconcile the problem of um, like that sort of central problem um, with making such a, like, how do you reconcile the problem with making such a strong argument based upon data that really does not reflect the activity of the subject matter that you are studying, I guess, is, is perhaps, hopefully, some sort of coherent um, form, way of posing the question. Great. Thanks, Simon. All right. Next in line, I have Michael Light. Um, hold on a second here. Michael, go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll just echo one quick. It's really more of a, so I think you can answer it broadly and then specifically. I do have one quick and then I'll ask a different question. So Simon, thank you for preempting that. You know, I just took a look. I think 13% of state prisoners are in prison for homicide. 3% of federal prisons prisoners are there for homicide. So I do think it's at least a fair point to think about um, uh, just, I mean, just from a pure measurement standpoint. So everyone grants the ar argument that it's by far the most accurate measure of crime. But uh, so that's, you know, no, no, no issues there. But the, the question is still one where just thinking about is this actually accurately is how strong of a proxy is this for overall levels of criminality, particularly levels of criminality to which people tend to end up being in prison. So I just think that's at least worth to think about. I have a question. So you obviously this is a big project, right? This is, you know, both looking historically comparatively. So there's a lot. So there's there's some pretty kind of sweeping uh, stories here in terms of thinking about elites, the welfare state and things like that. So I'm just curious if, I guess I'll point out just one specific, and I'm just curious your thoughts in terms of, so the, I guess one of the problems with sort of grand narratives is when you get into some of the specifics, it's you, you're trying to reconcile some of those. So I'll just give an example. Uh, John, I think you spoke quite a bit about sort of elites and sort of how they can, uh, the, you know, the levers they can pull in terms of punitiveness. You know, I was just thinking about books like Locking Up Our Own and Black Silent Majority, uh, uh, where there's, you know, the, the, there's quite a, there, during this time, there's quite a bit of support, uh, particularly from the Black community for um, both social programs, but also uh, more policing and more prisons and things like that. So uh, I'm just curious, like, how does your, how does, how do those narratives fit into your narrative? And is it, does it just complicate it further? I guess I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, going to 
Christina Green at this point, and if you'd like, you can activate your camera. Okay, um, I want to thank um, our speakers, um, and I had a similar um, question to uh, to Simon's, and I guess um, in using homicide and the focus on violence as a measurement, I thought, well, what about the war on drugs? And I think I'm thinking about Michelle Alexander's response and her new um, introduction to the new Jim Crow, the 10th anniversary in which she answers critics who said, well, you don't focus on violent crimes. And she talks about the numbers and saying, yes, at any given moment, there are gonna be more people imprisoned for violent crimes. Um, but if you look at the overall numbers, she still is making this argument for the impact of the war on drugs in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s as a causal explanation for um, increased incarceration rates. And then they, again, I'm also just thinking about convict leasing in the post-Civil War South, and then also federal money to local and state governments um, beginning in the 1960s, um, uh, that, that the, the when John was talking about, you know, more money to prisons than to than to police and looking at sort of federal versus state monies. And yes, states and localities have less money, but there's also this big infusion um, that Heather Thompson has said this was an unprecedented um, financial support for local policing and um, imprisonment and various other forms of, of sort of carceral um, politics and punitive um, um, policy. So I'll um, leave it at that. Great. Thanks, Christina. So all three of those questions had some overlap. Um, go for it. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all for those excellent questions. When Patrick asked us how we wanted to do the q and I said we wanted to take three questions at a time. And now I think <laughs> now I think that's going to be a challenge because there's a lot in there. Let's so John, I, I'm going to try John and then you John, you'll just back clean up right and take a couple of them. OK, so yeah. uh, let me start with the issue of homicide, since that came up in both Simon and Michael and Christina's questions. Um, I think this is, this is, I think, the central challenge for us. And I, you're totally right, all of you, to put your finger on it. Um, I think one way to think about the issue is what would we, why, why might we think that these measures would be biased measures, right? We've agreed that we can't measure really anything else reliably probably comparatively today. If you look at police data today collected by the UN, you'll see that El Salvador has the aggravated assault rate that's like one half the aggravated assault rate in France, right? So we know that we can't really measure this reliably comparatively today relying on government collected data. So the question is, why might we think these data teach us anything or might they just teach us nothing using the homicide rate? And I think when you think about rich countries, there's an obvious reason to think that this might be biased, right? The obvious reason to think this, this might be biased is because the United States has guns and therefore turns something like serious interpersonal harm, which is what we're trying to measure, into homicide at a rate, you might say, that's much, much higher than the rate in other countries. So guns, it seems to me, are like the central reason to worry that this would be profoundly biased as a measure of what we're trying to measure, which is kind of like the welfare weighted rate of crime or something. But John and I think that guns don't really explain American violence. We don't think it's a very good explanation of American violence. And we're not gonna be able to maybe give you the full reason now. We certainly have to argue this point more clearly in the book, but roughly the reason to think that guns don't matter is that guns don't really fit the key cross-sectional, cross-national, and historical patterns in violence that you see in the data. So cross-sectionally, access to guns is much more, much easier for richer, whiter households, all of whom report much higher rates of gun ownership. But there, the homicide rate in those households is very similar to the homicide rate in Europe. It's just not that different. Um, cross-nationally, the United States has overwhelmingly many more guns per capita than other countries, but there are other countries where guns are much less, much more difficult to, to access, which have much, much higher rates of homicide than the United States. And historically, the United States had very, very high rates of homicide in the early 20th century when guns were also more difficult to access. So guns no doubt have some 
non-zero causal effect on homicide, but we just don't think that it's large enough to be a significant driver of homicide rates. And if that's true, then the reason to think that homicide would bias our measure of the welfare-weighted serious interpersonal harm measure of crime, I think the reason to think that, that it would bias, the, 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 the reason to think that it would bias it significantly is less, basically. In effect, we are trying to measure that, I think. We're fundamentally with the homicide rate, not trying to measure simply the rate of homicides, but the rate of something like serious interpersonal harm across time and place. And this is a reason, I think, to think that it wouldn't be that biased. But this is an ongoing challenge for us. And I thank all of you for raising it. Uh, the other issue I just wanted to say something about was that um, we use the language of under policing, which Simon put his finger on. And I just wanted to say very clearly that that is not a normative judgment. It's not, we're not arguing, John and I, that under policing means that the United States should have more police. That's in fact, something that John and I disagree about. And so we don't think that facts turn into values. So under policing was here just meant simply as a descriptive proposition using the, uh, using the proportion that we presented. So we wanna, in that sense, separate fact from value more clearly than maybe that term did. I'm sure there's something I'm missing, but I wanna give time for everyone. And John, you have lots of stuff to say too, I'm sure. Uh, well, I just wanted to correct you on that uh, last point, is that we don't actually use the word under, under policing to talk about America after the 1930s, precisely because I think that would be a, a I would not be happy with that term. Uh, I, I, I talked about America before the 1930s as under policed in the just the measure of police per capita, right, compared to the developed world, right? It's like it's, it's significantly lower uh, 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 compared even to, you know, Australia and, and Canada, right, very similar countries, right? have much more police per capita prior to the 1930s. By the 1930s, uh, the US is really just kind of typical if you measure in per capita terms. But of course, you might not just want to measure in per capita terms. And you might want to look at things like per crime, per, hom per homicide is what we do look at. But you could also look at things like per square mile. Uh, and we, 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 you know, we show that the US is, is a typical country in terms of uh, police per capita in the developed world. But you know, in some ways, that itself is surprising, right? I mean, I, I, I thought America would be more police per capita than you know, England, France, Norway, Sweden, uh, but it's not. Uh, in fact, many of those countries have more police per capita. And that was, that was to me, surprising, which is why you know, the, even though um, you know, the under-policing term is very, I would, I would reject it uh, for many other reasons too, right? Because of what, what is it, you know, it sounds like you, it sounds like you think that there should be you know, um, th this, this very brutal police force the US has now should be doing more brutalizing, right? That's that's certainly not something that that we would ever uh, we'd, we would ever say. And yet, it's true that 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 we were, I think, surprised by the data that we saw on, on on policing. And I'm trying to make sense of that in this concept of the penal balance, right? So that penal balance concept, just to, to address Christina's uh, question about uh, convict leasing, interestingly, that's even more skewed in the South, right? So you, Christina, you mentioned that um, you know convict leasing was one way, you know, to sort of for, for states to kind of subsidize, uh, um, uh, I think you said policing and prisons, but it, but it was a way to subsidize prisons and not not police. So uh, Southern uh, police forces were um, some of the smallest per capita in the country throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, to, so uh, the, the, the you know the South uh, is is an area, especially um, at the urban South, um, uh, we, we can see declines in police per capita. Uh, from the Reconstruction era, era, which actually saw a, a big expansion of policing, into the Jim Crow era, which was, saw a, a massive reduction in policing. And I would interpret that in terms of police per capita, right? I would interpret that as um, a, a deliberate racialized form of under-policing in the sense that uh, white, white elites had no desire whatsoever to um, uh, provide any form of protection to African-Americans, especially in urban regions of the South, uh, where they, is, in, fact, in fact, white rural elites benefited from uh, the urban South being a very dangerous place uh, during the during the Jim Crow era, and I think the the deliberate underfunding uh, and and reduction of funding in in policing, even while uh, you saw a a, 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 a rise of, of of incarceration under convict leasing, makes makes a lot of sense of that that choice to kind of make the severity uh, very harsh, um, especially in 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 the in, in the in the urban. Uh, South African Americans. 
So that's one question. I I I think I didn't get to the question of foreman and the and the question of um, the both and question of you know people, both foreman and others have argued that you know African Americans in the 70s and 80s are demanding both tougher sentencing and and more spending to um, reduce um, re reduce crime. And 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 our argument is simply that that's absolutely true. And we uh, and Adana and I have done extensive work on on, on public opinion data that shows that's true. Um, uh, but that what what they face is a state, uh, specifically a local state, a city a city level uh, government uh, that only hears one of those demands, right? And the argu and our argument is that the reason they only hear one of those demands is largely structural, is largely to do with the, with the with the fiscal capacity that cities have uh, to address crime, right? They don't have the capacity to redistribute from rich people because uh, usually these are poor cities, right? They don't have the capacity to tax uh, Silicon Valley. To, to pay for um, better schools, better better healthcare, uh, jobs programs, education, um, but they they do have the capacity to incarcerate more and shift that burden of it, of, of the cost up to the state, and that's why we argue that, that it's only the one of those demands, the demands for more severity that we saw in the 70s and 80s, that was listened to at the level of even by black politicians, right, at the level of city governments. All right, so we have. Um... A couple of questions that have been written out in the chat, and otherwise that means that we have a third person if who wants to jump in that we can take in this cluster of three questions. But the first one is relatively short by Deborah Myers. She asks, can you discuss any data comparing homicide clearance rates? And then, um, sorry, I can't, there's no real name attached to this email address um, or whatever it happens to be, but it says, Good day, thanks for the necessary platform. If a person goes to a correctional facility for rehabilitation, the most dominant method is to teach them the value of education and getting a job for countless amount of those incarcerated. Those two have always been undesirable attributes, factors, reading below grade level and unaddressed mental health issues. Does education and getting a job need to be examined so those individuals can make lifestyle adjustment rather than corrections. This is from Ralph Sims. Um, so I don't see a third question. So I'm gonna throw in a question of my own. Um, if you could go to slide 24, the one that you had up there for quite a while. Um, this is the, a puzzle jumps out. I'm sorry, slide 24, you have. John, do you want me to do it or I can do it? Could you do it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't seem to be able to do it. Yeah, so that what a puzzle jumps out of there for me, and I wonder if you could, if it does for you as well. So even though it's not all that fine grained in terms of the number of years, it appears that in the last two graphs, the violence rate plummets in the 90s, but in the next graph, punitiveness spikes during the same decade. And that strikes me as very interesting, the fact that those two things are happening simultaneously, that violence is plummeting and punitiveness is spiking. So just curious about your interpretation of that. So there's three questions. Great, John, do you want me to start? Yeah, you can. Start. Okay, All right, let me start. Um, let me start with, uh, with uh, Deborah's excellent question because I actually had a graph queued up to share in reply to it. So this is a graph can everyone see this? Am I sharing the right screen? So this is a graph which graphs something like the clearance rate in the United States, the police footprint, which is the second thing, and police focus, which is something we haven't introduced, but is something you could imagine. And you'll notice that the first, the sorry, the second panel here times the third panel here equals the first panel here. So clearance rate, which is like the number of homicide arrests made per homicide. I mean, there are many other ways to measure it, but this is the easiest way to measure it across time and place, equals the police footprint, which is something that we've discussed, multiplied by something like police focus. And you can see, as I think Deborah's question was implying, that the United States has a low clearance rate relative to other countries. Police do not solve homicide crime, or in this case, even just arrest people for homicide crime at a rate comparable to the rate in other developed countries. But what I think is interesting about this is that these two graphs, the, sorry, the two bottom panels of the, this graph 
kind of confound the traditional way of thinking about this. I think the traditional way of thinking about this, which I think was implied in one of the questions earlier, is that the reason that the United States has such a low clearance rate is because American police simply don't focus on homicide. They don't care about homicide and police elsewhere do. And so that establishes a very neat reform agenda, which is why don't the police care about serious violence less about petty offenses. But at least by this measure of police focus, which is the number of homicide arrests made by police in the United States, the United States is actually kind of distinct. It actually has a much higher rate of police focus. And what is really low relative to other countries is, as we were saying earlier, the police footprint. So to me, this kind of confounds our reform agenda for police, which is it seems kind of difficult to make police more focused given that they're already more focused than police elsewhere. It's just not, not in the nature of policing for there to be a lot of homicide arrests for police given what's happening elsewhere as well. And so the clearance rate really is governed, I think, by the, the police footprint. Uh, John, shall I take Patrick's question too? Or do you want to take it? So I, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to sort of take a stab at it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the the way, and, and maybe maybe you can uh, add anything I missed, but the way that we understand that that pattern, uh, Patrick, that you're observing, the the fact that um, uh, the, what we call uh, punitiveness is rising as the homicide rate is falling, um, is 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 simply the, a, a function of uh, the nature of incarceration, right? That incarceration is a stock, uh, and and that a stock of people being held at, at a given time is really a function of the past, right? It's not a function of the present. Um, so if we look at pr prison admission rates, they actually fall as the homicide rates fall, uh, pretty much consistent, like a couple of years lagged maybe, but not very much, not much of a lag at all. You don't see that, that, that kind of cross pattern which you're pointing to in prison admission rates. You see it only in the incarceration rate. And I would argue that's largely a function of the, of the long sentences that American prisoners are serving, right? That they're essentially, um, uh, the, the incarceration rate does begin to fall uh, after the crime rate falls in the 90s, but it doesn't start to fall until at least 10 years after the uh, crime rate falls. And, and given the, the nature of incarceration, that's not that surprising, I would argue. And, you know, this, I'm not the first to, to point this out. You know, the many, many criminologists have pointed out this kind of dimension of the stock flow problem in incarceration and how it's confusing sometimes to... to, to... But have you, have you got anything to add to that, Adana? No, that's great. That's great. That's what more or less what I wanted to say. And then I'll just quickly, uh, to, to Ralph's excellent question, I'll just say, Ralph, I think in some sense, we're all on the same page about this in that both John and I, and I think you do think that the correct, even though we're, we haven't really made any normative arguments for you, the correct way to attack the problems that manifest as mass incarceration is to attack the problem of America's weak social safety net and distributive injustice and inequality in the United States at its root. But one of the points that we have probably not made in as much, although John did say it, we make in more uh, detail in a catalyst essay that we wrote a few years ago called The Economic Origins of Mass Incarceration, is that that, let's say, preferred alternative, which is to attack the root causes of the problem that we're seeing in American prisons, that is just much, much more expensive. It requires much, much more redistribution from rich to poor than the symptomatic solution, the solution of attacking things when they manifest as crime. And it's for that reason, we think that the United States, which is so, which is in, in which redistribution from rich to poor is so underdeveloped relative to other capitalist countries that you see mass incarceration and not the kind of thing that you're arguing in your question. All right, so uh, the stack only has one individual so far who's asked a question. So that means that while I ask it, other people can think about raising their hand perhaps. So this is in the chat from Lewis Postal. What about, if I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, um, what about the prevalence of plea bargaining sending so many people to prison? Anybody else wanna ask a question? Well, if not, think about that while uh, John and Adana respond to this one. Thank you, Louis. Uh, so I, was, I would say that the, the, point, the point I was making to Patrick's question was really uh, 
derived from John Pfaff's work on, on thinking about the stock flow of incarceration. And Pfaff's work is also very good on, on plea bargaining, and I would recommend it. I, I, I haven't studied uh, plea bargaining specifically, but I, I very much learned from John Pfaff's work on this. And wh what Pfaff emphasizes is that um, the, the plea bargaining system, even though you know, it has various legal roots in terms of um, uh, the, the, the various kinds of um, uh, uh, charges that can be brought uh, that, that changed in the, in the 1980s, that, that, that the fundamental power of prosecutors in the plea bargaining, uh, 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 contemporary arrangements of plea bargaining, bargaining is, is driven by um, uh, the, the, the emergence of the of fixed sentence lengths, um, um, often mandatory minimum sentences that were high, sometimes fixed sentences that were designed to lower um, uh, average sentences or to reduce uh, disparities in sentencing. Uh, but the effect of that, often an unintentional effect of that, was to grant to prosecutors inordinate power to choose by choosing the sentence that they're going to threaten you with, to give them leverage then to, in the plea bargaining phase, uh, convince um, uh, defendants to uh, uh, accept l a lesser plea, a lesser charge, uh, uh, nonetheless one that would have a, a, a prison sentence associated with it, that previously when they are, when, when sentence length is, is much more in the discretion of judges, uh, you, you're you much more likely to sort of um, uh, be willing to face the judge when the when the when the sentence length is taken out of the, of the judge's hand. It's really the prosecutor who has the power then to impose the sentence by choosing uh, what they're going to charge you with. And and I think that's has a, has a lot to do with the nature of the prison boom, specifically the late prison boom in the nineties that 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 Baff is observing. The fact that it, the fact that there's a big delay between the decline in, in crime and the decline in incarceration may in part be driv driven by the fact that many people are also arriving uh, in front of a judge with previous um, uh, um, previous uh, charges that then the prosecutors can use to add uh, sentence lengths in the, in, in, the, in the plea bargaining phase. So it gives prosecutors, I think, an inordinate amount of power to drive up not so much the incarceration the average sentence, but the number of people who are convicted and, 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 and admitted to prison. Great, we've got a couple more questions. So um, I'm gonna, one is from Michael Below. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Um, and then we'll go to one in the chat. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, Adana and John, good to see you. Uh, it was a really uh, excellent presentation. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, just ask for a little bit of elaboration on the point um, that Adana, you suggested in your section of the presentation when you compared the United States to um, other sort of countries in the uh, Western Hemisphere and the Caribbean, other sort of former slave societies. I know, John, you work on um, the political economy of slavery. Uh, and I, I feel like there was a, I feel like you sort of showed that um, comparison, but then didn't really drive home the, um, the meat of the point. And I guess I wanted to invite you to do so. It, you, you sort of summed up that, um, that last bit with uh, America's, um, what is it, violent for a rich country and rich for a violent country? Um, is, is the point there that uh, like a previous um, history of slavery sort of drives a sort of um, uh, level of violence uh, like at the baseline that then is later sort of worked up into an incarceration rate? Um, and if that's the point, uh, what could you sort of uh, talk a little bit about the mechanisms that produce that even, you know, sort of uh, a century and late, you know, more on uh, after the sort of abolition of slavery. So that's my question. Thanks, Michael. So uh, the last question in this cluster comes again from Deborah Myers, who asks in the chat, does the development of private shareholder oriented pris prisons play a role in the 1970s inflection point? So private prisons. John, let me start with uh, Deborah's question, then I'll take a stab at uh, Michael's question and then you uh, fix my answer. So, uh, Deborah, I think in short, my answer to that would be no. The reason I think that is because only about 8% of American prisoners today, I don't know the figure for the 1970s, but I, I imagine it was less, only about 8% of prisoners are held in private prisons. I think it probably makes more sense, in my view, to think of private prisons as almost an effect rather than a cause of mass incarceration as a consequence rather than a cause. And the reason I think that is I recently, maybe not so recently, read a paper which tried to understand when it is that states turn to private prisons, when it is that 
prisoners are incarcerated in private prisons. And the paper pretty convincingly made the argument that that's often in response to lawsuits about conditions of prison brutality in public systems, in public prisons. So it's a way kind of for the state to wash its hands of brutality in American prisons and to shift accountability in effect. And so that, in, if you think about it in that way, it's sort of after the boom in mass incarceration and after the deteriorating conditions in American prisons, after the brutality of American prisons increased, it was a way private prisons become a way for some state administrations to wash their hands of the problem. So I, I think of it more as a consequence than as a cause. I just think it can be a cause, but it's not so numerous. Um, so in response to Michael's question, which Michael's great question, and you're totally right that we didn't really make the meat of the argument clear. The way that I think about this, but John has veto because this really is his area, is I think of the United States as being doubly unique in a sense. I mean, that was sort of the reason for these two comparisons. The United States is the only developed country to also have been a slave society or alternative, the only slave society to also have been a developed country. And so slavery has yielded violence through the mechanisms that John described, which is by impeding redistribution from rich to poor, by creating a racially divided working class, which hasn't been able to push for redistribution, thus creating such severe problems of concentrated poverty. And there are a few other political mechanisms there, but that's the key. But then slavery plus development, the fact that the United States was this kind of merger of a slave society with a settler colony, the North, meant that the United States was also a developed country. And so it also had the state capacity to do the kind of turning of violence into incarceration that stands out so starkly when you do the comparison of the US to the ex-America's country. So it's that dual inheritance. It's a slave society that's also a developed society that we think together explain the puzzle of mass incarceration. But John, you fixed that answer. No, no, that's actually a nice summary. All right, well, um, we have a few minutes, if, um, about four. Uh, so if anybody wants to ask a quick question, um, yes, indeed, somebody does. Lauren Peabody, so I'm gonna ask you to go on camera if you'd like. Hi, John, hi, Donner. Um, thanks for coming. Um, you broadly talk about you know violence at, or crime as an index of oppression. And you talk about the rise in uh, rate of violence in the 60s uh, from the um, baby boom, you know, young population bulge with the uh, uh, second great migration, just as industrialization, deindustrialization is hitting uh, northern cities. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could tell us a little bit more about, like, I mean, do you, have you thought in more detail, like the, the mechanisms of, like, do you have like a theory of crime that you, um, that you, uh, you, you know, think fits best in your, in your approach. And also maybe particularly like if, how would that apply to like the, the big crime decline since the mid nineties, you know, um, for example, you know, urban poverty rates, I don't know if that's the best measure, but urban poverty rates haven't come down like a lot, uh, since the mid nineties, but the, uh, until like two years ago, the, murder rate had, had fallen in, in about half, right? So I'd be curious about the kind of theoretical and then that explain that trend. Thanks. John, you first? I'm not going first on that one, that's too hard. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard question. Um, are you seriously not gonna go first? Shall I go first? No, no, I, 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 can, try. I, I can try. Let me try, let me try. Okay, so I think, Lauren, it's a great question. I think that the way that I would like to think about the way that I like to think about this is that what we have is a broadly kind of materialist theory of crime. And the way to think of it as like a materialist, economic, economistic theory of crime is to think of the work of Gary Becker, maybe start with the work of Gary Becker and then fix the model. But the Gary Becker model is roughly the, um, that a person's de decision to commit a crime is going to be a function both of the licit options available to the person in the economy. So where the economy deteriorates, where urban poverty rates are high, where opportunities are low, then the incentive to commit crime goes up. That makes perfect sense. And I think that harmonizes with the kind of thing that 
you were summarizing so well that we tried to argue in the Catalyst essay about the rise in the 60s. But there is another component to the, to the Becker model, which is that crime also, the incentive to commit crime also does go down when people look at the prospect of being punished, when the when they basically weigh the illicit option against the illicit option. And one input into the illicit option is how severe punishment is and how certain the probability of punishment is, how high the probability of being punished is and how severe that punishment is. And in fact, I think what you see in the 1990s is that while the first doesn't change that dramatically, although there is a boom in the labor market in the 90s, it doesn't happen in the 2000s, but it doesn't persist in the 2000s, but there is a boom in the 90s. What does very clearly change in the United States is the severity of punishment. And even the certainty to some extent goes up. So both of the kind of the, the while the licit part of the model isn't changing that dramatically, the illicit option, the, the kind of costs of pursuing a life of crime get much, much more severe as the penal state expands. And that we think no doubt had some kind of impact on crime. There were probably also some exogenous reasons that crime went down, but that I think is my preferred model. That's my preferred way of making sense of what happened in the 90s. It's not so much about the root causes, but it really about how the United States dealt with the symptoms. John, All right. I would, I would give a different, slightly different answer to that question, but I wouldn't have a theory of crime that I'd be willing to, to sort of defend. I would just say that one way of, of, of sort of taking your first pass at this is to say like crime can be defined in many different ways and is defined in many, many different ways in different societies. But one thing that is, I think, universal in capitalist societies is that if you look in prisons, prisons are full of people who are radically disadvantaged economically uh, in terms of um, their background, in terms of their exp life experiences in many cases, but often in terms of poverty. And, and, and the idea that we should think of what the prison does as in some ways um, uh, attack poor people. And, and that is, I think, my sort of starting point in understanding the relationship between an economic cr crisis like that in the 1970s and the you know, very clear rise, rise of crime that we see during that period, right? That people turn to crime when they have fewer opportunities, as Adana mentioned, you know, I think that part of the story is very clear and very obvious. Um, and people turn to crime, but not just in terms of a uh, way of, uh, as, a, as a means of gaining a living, right? But also um, uh, because they're, they're often driven to, to, to sort of survive in a very difficult, very risky manner, um, uh, given the absence of legal uh, paths to stable, secure income and family life. Um, people are driven to um, all manner of, of behaviors that lead them into prison. Um, and, and the idea being that, that that's what prisons do. They, they kind of absorb large share, a share of the poor population of any given time. Uh, and, and they tend to grow, I think, in, in general, incarceration population tends to grow during periods of depression and recession. It's not a, it's not a rigid law, but it's a pretty clear one to me in, in, in my estimates of the, of the data. So I have a kind of macro story that I would want to say that not, the micro foundations are perhaps, perhaps not as, um, as robust as, as Adana's answer. All right, wonderful. Um, I'm afraid we've reached the end of our time here, but I'm happy to say that we have another opportunity tomorrow. And then it sounds like that answer uh, could serve, at least in some respects, as a segue into tomorrow's talk, uh, which is what's wrong with mass incarceration? That is the normative challenge of the, um, the study of mass incarceration. So we're hoping that all of you can return tomorrow just to alert you that it's gonna be at an hour earlier than the, the start time of today's talk, that is 12 noon central time or 12 p.m. in the UK if you happen to be coming from Europe. So we really wanna thank both John and Donner uh, for this really stimulating discussion. And again, once again, welcome you to return tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank you, thanks for having thank us, you. thanks for the questions.